Master of the Sclerosis Derma Vasculitis and Myositis Center at Hospital for Special Surgery. Just want to go over a little housekeeping before we get started. We will mute everyone and ask that you turn your video off to help facilitate a better presentation with less interruptions or technical and bandwidth issues. Questions can be typed in the chat box. I will present your questions to the speakers at the conclusion of the presentation. Today's webinar is being recorded and will be available on HSS SDM website at a later time. The, the address will be in the chat box in a couple of minutes. For HIPAA privacy considerations, the question and answer portion of the program will not be recorded or available to the public. We would appreciate if you would complete the short evaluation at the end of the program. This will help the speakers develop future educational programs for you. You will find the link in the chat box and on the PowerPoint. For those attending today who are not familiar with the Tri-State Chapter of the Scleroderma Foundation, they serve the scleroderma community in New York, Connecticut, and Northern New Jersey with a mission of support, education, and research. For more information on the chapter, visit their website at sclerodermatristate.org. For more information on the HSS SVM Center, you can visit hss.edu scleroderma vasculitis center. The Scleroderma Vasculitis and Myositis Center at Hospital for Special Surgery and Tri-State Chapter of the Scleroderma Foundation have a long history of collaboration. Today's program will feature Mary Rose Murray Perry and Baptiste Nicholas presenting Mental Health Matters, Chronic Disease and How to Support Your Mental Health. Mary, Ro Mary Rose joined HSS in May 2022 as a social work manager of the Rheumatology Division. She is responsible for the strategic direction, direction, planning and operational oversight of program initiatives related to advancing the highest level of service to this community. She manages all aspects of social work services, including patient care, program planning and evaluation, and the development of procedures and protocols to address social work needs. She ensures that patients who are at high, who are at high psychosocial risk are assessed and provided with appropriate resources and referrals and advocates for patients who need, whose, whose needs through collaboration with the entire healthcare team. She, she is responsible for the supervision of social work staff in adult rheumatology and the Voices 60 program. Her professional interests include the development of emerging clinicians, psychosocial issues around terminal and life limiting illness for patients and their families, and the improvement of healthcare access and disparities. Baptiste Nicholas works with HSS adult rheumatology patients who are coping with a new diagnosis or chronic condition like scleroderma. As a clinical social worker, Baptiste works closely with the medical team to assess any barriers to care and finds workable solutions to enhance the patient's quality of life. He has a real interest in reducing the emotional impact of chronic illness on day-to-day -day function and improving access to care at HSS. Again, please type your questions in the chat. We will do our best to respond to as many as possible during the hour program. I will be monitoring the chat room and combine like questions. We will, start, we will start today's program with Mary Rose and Baptiste. Welcome. Thank, Thank you, Elizabeth. You, Elizabeth. And hi, good evening, everyone, um, and welcome. My name is Batiste Nicholas. We are very honored to be here tonight. And I am um, HSS's adult rheumatology social worker. And I'd also like to introduce you, as uh, Elizabeth did, Mary Rose Carey, social work manager of rheumatology at HSS. And of course, we would like to thank Elizabeth Soto Cardona from the HSS SVM Center for inviting us to present and uh, for her excellent collaboration. And this evening, we will be discussing a topic that's very important to us, which is mental health support and emotional well-being for those with a chronic illness. Um, this is an important topic because a diagnosis of a chronic illness brings with it a much higher rate of mental health concern. Our goal tonight is to share the benefits of emotional support and encourage you to pursue uh, this and uh, hopefully it's something you might consider. Um, we know that you are already dealing with a lot in the management of your illness, and this is only made more difficult if your emotional well-being is impacted. You may not be sure of where to start, and again, about half of people with a mental health concern in this country are not receiving the support that could benefit them, and we want to help change that and uh, bring out some conversation. 
And also, I'm not sure if anyone noticed, but our original title was Mental Health Matters, Chronic Disease and How to Support Your Mental Health. But we want to make it clear that this is really about more than just your mental health. It's also about your entire emotional well-being, which is why we switched the title of the uh, presentation. So tonight we have several objectives for this presentation. These include helping you understand common mental health concerns for people with a chronic illness, becoming more familiar with some symptoms of anxiety and depression, and to understand barriers, barriers to seeking support for this. We will also review tips on how to discuss these uh, emotional well-being with your doctor and go over support options. And finally, we will also be providing some resources. We'd like to begin by having you take a look at this slide and give it some thought. Have you ever felt this way? These are common feelings of depression and they include feelings of sadness or worthlessness, guilt and loss of hope. There may be feelings of anger or irritability as well as loss of pleasure in your regular activities. Sleep and appetite changes, including sleeping or eating too much or too little are pretty common. These can also seem like physical symptoms. For example, you may think that your tiredness is due to your chronic illness, but you could also be experiencing a symptom of depression. <clears throat> symptoms of anxiety are also very common in chronic illness. These include the above, such as restlessness, trouble concentrating, frequent feelings of worry, and sleep problems, again, like sleeping too much or too little. Just like with feelings of depression, feelings of anxiety can sometimes seem like physical symptoms related to your medical condition. If you're comfortable sharing, feel free to type this in the chat box. Um, have any of you ever experienced the feelings described on the last two slides? We can go over this a little bit um, during the question and answer session at the end. So it's um, it's like not the easiest thing to talk about. And thank you, Melissa, for sharing. And yes, is un unfortunately correct. Um, these can be very uh, challenging and uh, hard symptoms to deal with, which is why we want to discuss it further. And again, it's not the easiest topic to talk about. So I understand some people may be feeling some of these symptoms as well. Uh, and Janelle, and yes, um, Irritated mood swings, yeah. loss of appetite. So sure. Like this, yeah. Yeah. These are these are all very common, and we really thank you very much for sharing. Exactly. Um, you know, this is you're not alone in this, and we're certainly going to get into that a little bit more. But but none of these are unusual. This is this is a really common thing for people to experience. Yeah. And as uh, Mary Rose said, thank you for sharing, and uh, we just want you to know these feelings are not unusual. Um, in fact, the U.S. Preventative Service Task Force recently recommended that all adults under the age of 65 be screened for anxiety as anxiety rates have gone up quite a bit over the last few years. They've skyrocketed, unfortunately. Uh, the group also recommended that adults be screened for depression. And due to COVID, financial problems, cultural differences, other issues in society, and many other life stressors, Anxiety and depression are high in this country right now, so emotional well-being is an important topic to discuss, but it's especially important to discuss with you. And why is that? Well, although rates of anxiety and depression may be high in general, people with a chronic illness are even more likely to have a mental health concern than those without a chronic condition. And you might be wondering why that is, and there are several reasons, actually. As we spoke about a little bit earlier, a chronic illness requires lifelong management, and adapting to this management can be really hard, bringing on new fears, anxiety, and depression, or worsening mental health symptoms that you already had. A rheumatology illness itself can cause depression. It can also cause physical and emotional changes, such as making your activities of daily living, which are bathing, showering, dressing, getting in and out of bed, or a chair, walking, using the toilet, even eating, can make all of these more challenging, it may cause pain and fatigue, change your ability to drive or work, 
make it hard to talk with your loved ones and cause feelings of isolation and loneliness. It's also really important to be aware of how cultural norms for you may be contributing to your feelings of anxiety or depression following a rheumatological diagnosis and then the changes caused by those symptoms. For example, perhaps it's really important for you to be the primary financial support for your family and your illness just makes that impossible. This can feel really embarrassing or shameful, increasing feelings of anxiety or depression. Or it may be that emotional well-being is just not something that's typically discussed in your family or in your world. So in addition to feeling anxious and depressed, you feel very isolated and alone with these feelings. We share this to show you just how normal your feelings are. It really makes sense that the combination of a new diagnosis, associated and really tough symptoms, the impact that these might have on your daily life, and all the role changes that you have to navigate, these would all contribute to increased mood symptoms. However, interestingly, research has also shown that not addressing your mental health concerns can actually make your physical symptoms worse, including your pain. So it's really, really important to take care of your mind and your body. And whether you strongly identify with feelings from these lists or not, or whether you've really thought about it much before, it's important to discuss any concerns about your emotional well-being with your healthcare team. This may seem a little overwhelming, but there are several things you can do to make it a bit easier. Starting with, you know, your primary care provider. If you really don't know where to go, you may want to consider bringing up your concerns during an appointment with your regular physician. They can start treatment, provide resources, or refer you to a mental health professional for further evaluation. It's really important to prepare ahead of your visit. Research shows that on average, you might only spend about 18 minutes with your doctor. So it's important to be ready with a list of questions, a list of your medications, and any important family medical or mental health history. Consider having someone come with you to your appointment. You receive a lot of information during these very short doctor's visits, which can be overwhelming, and it can be really helpful to have someone there to take additional notes, remind you of any questions or concerns you had, or just to support you. And be open. This is what I consider the most important tip. Your doctor can really only help you if they actually know what's going on with you. And it can be hard, but try to be as honest as possible with any symptoms, feelings, or concerns so that they can work with you towards the best options. And finally, ask questions. You are your own best advocate. If your doctor suggests something that you don't understand or don't feel comfortable with, make sure you ask for clarification or alternate options. So <clears throat> as we've now discussed, there are many people facing mental health concerns and some of you shared that yourself. But we know that not everyone is seeking support or treatment. And why might that be? There really are several barriers, but some of the major ones include access to care, which could mean a lack of mental health providers in your area or inability to access care because of the cost. Lack of knowledge or understanding around support options is also a big challenge, but that's one we're trying to work on this evening. And finally, stigma around mental health conditions can be a major obstacle to seeking support. So there are some, there is some good news about this. Um, the expansion of telehealth has greatly improved access to care. In fact, you know, you're, this is an example of telehealth in a way right here. Um, we'll touch on this in more detail in a few moments, but we know that there are many places with very few or no mental health providers, but telehealth makes it more possible to access this care wherever you are. However, there remain real challenges, even with this expansion of telehealth. You may not have a private or comfortable space at home to access this care. You may have limited internet access or no internet access, or you may not be comfortable utilizing some of the necessary technology. Unfortunately, telehealth also doesn't solve the affordability of care concern. However, there are lower cost options available for mental health support. Many providers and clinics offer sliding scale or low cost services, 
and many community agencies offer entirely free resources and support groups, some of which we'll be sharing later this evening. Community service agencies can also sometimes assist with access or with training on various internet platforms if that's something you need um, attention to. Another thing that can make seeking mental health support challenging is just not knowing where to start, not knowing what's out there. Going to your healthcare team, as mentioned before, is a great place to begin. And not just your doctor, but also social workers and other support staff. Your insurance provider may have a database of covered providers as well. And community service agencies, again, can be a great resource for this. Awareness is really important. You first have to know what's available before you can give it a try. Thank you, Mero. So I'll be discussing a bit about stigma. Uh, so stigma is admittedly one of the toughest barriers to overcome. Stigma can be defined as a set of negative and often unfair beliefs that society or a group of people have about something. In this case, mental health concerns and treatment. So one example is if someone thinks that there's something wrong with an individual who sees a therapist, that would be a stigma. And unfortunately, uh, negative attitudes and beliefs around mental health conditions can be common. This can create feelings of shame and loneliness, which may lead you to avoid seeking support. And while it's understandable that this may hold you back from asking for help, there are some real effects of not seeking support. Common effects of stigma are reduced hope, lower self-esteem, increased symptoms, difficulties with relationships, and lower likelihood of starting or staying with treatment. And these all have consequences to your happiness and your daily functioning. Getting care for your emotional well-being is kind of like going to the doctor for a physical illness. Imagine how you might feel if you do not see a doctor to address the phys physical symptoms of your condition. Probably not great. However, you know that meeting with your doctor, taking your medication, and following your treatment plan can greatly improve your symptoms. And addressing your emotional well-being is the same. Feeling anxious or depressed doesn't make you weak, nor does seeking treatment to make yourself feel better. You aren't alone and you definitely deserve support. And with all that said, what options are out there for you if you've decided to pursue support? I'm gonna go over two common methods of address addressing emotional well-being. And the first would be individual therapy, where you can see a therapist on a regular basis. This can be done in person or remotely. And another option is taking part in support groups, which occur on a schedule, depending on the type of group, or which you can join on an as-needed basis. These are attended by others who share your diagnosis or concerns. And there is no one best treatment. It's all about what works for you. The type of support right for you is personal and may take some time to discover. And if getting out of the house to go to weekly therapy appointments is not possible, or if there are no providers close by, as Mary Rose mentioned, telehealth is an option. Since the beginning of the COVID pandemic, there has been a huge rise in telehealth availability and usage. And this is especially important for those who live in a more rural area where there may be fewer providers. And a recent survey by the American Psychological Association reports that 96% of therapists say that telehealth therapy is effective. This is promising. It means that good support can be available for you no matter where you are. So now let's talk a bit more about individual therapy. This might be the most well-known form of therapy and what you might think of when you picture therapy. Within therapy, there are many different types, such as, but not limited to, supportive and cognitive behavioral therapy. Supportive therapy is really common for treating mood disorders such as depression and anxiety. And it's a collaborative type of psychotherapy. The therapist supports the client in talking about their emotions and challenges to help encourage change, identify strengths, and reduce, <clears throat> excuse me, stress and anxiety. The most important part of this kind of therapy is a good connection between the client and the therapist. This is known as the therapeutic alliance. There are to this, but most importantly, these include decreased mood symptoms and increased self-esteem. 
And cognitive behavioral therapy, um, also known as CBT, some of you may have heard of it, is a structured, goal-oriented type of talk therapy. It can help with symptoms of mental health conditions such as depression and anxiety. CBT can also help manage physical health conditions such as insomnia and chronic pain. I will be sharing just a brief overview of CBT this evening, but if this is something you pursue, your therapist will share with you in much deeper explanation. So I'm gonna just say a few things about CBT here, but again, it's just for general information. And if it's something you're interested in, I would highly recommend speaking further with someone about it and they can help explain it in much more detail. So the main goals of CBT are as follows. To gain a better understanding of the issue. At the start of therapy, you'll discuss challenges and concerns you're dealing with and symptoms you've noticed. This will help your therapist along with you to identify a course of action. Ask a series of questions. In order to better understand the root of the issue, the therapist, usually in the first session, will get some background information. Help you recognize challenging thoughts and behaviors. Through question and answer sessions, your therapist will work with you to identify emotions, beliefs, or behaviors that may be adding to your distress. Work with you to change your thoughts and behaviors. Your therapist will help you find ways to change emotions, thoughts, and habits that might be negatively, negatively impacting you, leading to new thought patterns and behaviors. Then you can apply those skills to future situations. And cognitive therapy is helpful in managing chronic health symptoms, including feelings of anxiety and depression, as well as many of the long-term symptoms of chronic physical illness, including pain, which is another reason that I am focusing on CBT today. It has been very well researched and the results are positive. Studies have shown that change can be seen in anywhere from five to 20 sessions. So uh, I, I very much emphasize this, that you may have to give it some time to work it may not work in the first or second session, um, but I highly encourage you to stick with it and uh, you know you could start to see results. And as always, please make sure you're in contact with your provider about how you're feeling during treatment. Another great option for supporting your mental health goals is participating in a support group. This can be done in addition to individual therapy or as a standalone form of support. Support groups come in many forms, just like individual therapy, including in-person or telehealth and online groups, and serve many purposes. Groups can also be structured in different ways. Some are led by a mental health professional, such as a social worker or a counselor, while some are peer-led, which means they're led by a trained layperson who doesn't give advice or act as an expert, but guides the group through discussion and has shared experience with the group. So they, for your information, uh, what we share on the following slides, including the resources we share, reference mutual support groups rather than formal therapy groups. And with that said, there are many benefits to the group model of mental health support. They are a way to connect with other people who share your concerns while also getting tips and insight from group members. Groups can also be excellent for sharing resources and helping with decision-making. And if you do not want to attend an in-person group, or if it's not accessible, online support might also be an option, online support groups that is. It is the same as an in-person group, but done over a virtual platform such as Zoom, just like tonight. And engaging in peer-led support groups can allow for feeling of connection, showing participants that they are not alone, and helping them gain different ideas for addressing symptoms of anxiety, depression, pain, or other concerns. Sometimes even the simple act of sharing your concerns and feelings can be helpful. And this is important. If you enroll in a peer support group, you do not have to speak. You can listen and observe. A well-run support group will require members to respect each other, even if they do not agree, and they will be committed to confidentiality. It should be a safe space. Support groups have also been shown in studies to be very effective in many ways, including relief of emotional concerns and physical symptoms. So now we'll, here's a couple of the resources that we were mentioning. So the National Scleroderma Foundation offers multiple support groups and networks. On the support groups, 
support group screen, you can filter by in-person, telephonic, virtual, and email. Myasite support and understanding has a free anonymous 24 seven support page just for the Myasitis community. They also have a clubhouse app, which is a free audio only social media app, as well as links and resources to other support groups. And finally, the Vasculitis Foundation offers online support groups, educational videos and newsletters. If you don't have the time or don't wanna participate in full group sessions, you can also utilize message boards read other people's stories and be kept up to date on new research. Um, so we're gonna wrap up in just a minute and we will have time for question and answers then. Um, so please be thinking of questions to put in the chat um, when we wrap up. Yes, and thank you so much um, everyone for uh, being part of our presentation tonight on mental health and emotional well-being and chronic illness. As I mentioned before, this is a topic very important for us. I hope that we were able to uh, convey some important information. And as we did discuss, there is no one right option uh, as you're exploring mental health support and you could should work with your doctor and support team on what might be best for you. With a little time, support can reduce symptoms of anxiety, depression, and even pain which may ultimately make management of chronic disease and of daily life easier. You deserve the chance to feel better. And we hope that you find this information helpful. Please help us continue to improve our offerings by completing a survey, which I will post in the um, link to the chat. And we, again, appreciate your time this evening and look forward to uh, some question and answers. And if you have any questions on what we discussed or anything else uh, related to this topic.